to join his fan club and I hope you guys over there are having a good time and this letter comes all the way from Lagos in Nigeria <laughs> how about that for international fame eh what's next do you think <laughs> <laughs> oh oh Joe did I frighten me lad yes you did good that's what I was supposed to do this is a skull and crossbones flag I found in an old sea chest and Joseph Flat wants to know why do they have skulls and crossbones on them? And the answer was to frighten the living daylights out of the person they were trying to take over. Ha! And it worked. Joe, I'll put that there. What be this? You don't know. A piece of eight. Ha ha ha! Ho ho ho. I mean cool! <laughs> How'd you get it cool? Hello? What's that? <gasps> that must be a treasure map! Ah! A treasure map! <laughs> Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! It's utter, utter madness. Now, Gary Muir of Warrington wants to know why pieces of eight are called pieces of eight. Well, this is a piece of eight. Now, pieces of eight were Spanish coins that were made in the Spanish colonies in North and South America in the 17th century. And um, they were made in the silver mines. And they were made in huge numbers. And because they were made of pure silver, they were very valuable to the pirates that raided the Spanish ships. Now, they get their name because they were worth eight reals, which was a Spanish unit of currency, which was worth about uh, four shillings and sixpence, or 22 and a half pence in modern English money, which was quite a lot of money in those days. And um, the pirates called them pieces of eight, and so did their parrots. What's all this in the mystery corner? Something for Joe to make a treasure map with, perhaps? Well, it could be, because all these instruments are for making maps, or to give it its proper term, cartography. Now, we've had a letter from Ian Thompson from Tyne and Weir, and he says, could you please tell me how maps of the world were drawn without being able to see the countries from space? Well, this is a very early map. It dates from 1617, and it's a map of the world, and this, like others at the time, were actually drawn from local knowledge or from people's um, travels. You get travellers explorers, sailors would go down to say, the coast of Africa and they would draw what they saw as they went along and they would make up a very primitive type of map. Put all those maps together and you get a map of the world. And all the countries are there, though it does look a little bit inaccurate. But by 1791, the Ordnance Survey started making maps like this, which is a lot more accurate. It's got a lot of detail on it. This is, um, I think this is part of Dorset. And they used various instruments. This is one of them. It's actually a chain. And you get a gang of Ordnance Survey men would go around the country, or around the coastland, and they'd lay out a chain like this. They'd actually count the distance from one place to another and start putting their map together. These days, it's a bit more easy, because this is the tool that um, cartographers use. It's called a tachyometer. There's nothing tacky about it. If you look through it, you can actually see over to the other side of the hill where you'd have one of those things. It's called a stadia rod, and it's got various um, information on it, and you could focus in and then get a read off of how far you were away and this reads at three meters and not only was it more accurate but you could actually save yourself the bother of walking down mountains walking across rivers because you stand on one side get your mate on the other side of the mountain and you can read off the distance and put your map together over here you've got the modern up-to-date version of that it's called a geodometer and this is exactly the same sort of thing only it fires an infrared beam of light across the hill over to that there which is called a reflector that reflects the infrared light back and then the, according to the amount of time it took to go there and back you can read your distance and again start getting your information but if you're trying to calculate the distance of countries and continents well you can't really beat the satellite photograph quick simple and saves you quite a bit of legwork <laughs> Doubloons, rubies, emeralds, treasure trove. We could be rich, Nigel. Rich, do you hear? We're going to have loads of hey, treasure. Hey, what's this, Joe? Ah, 
This is an ancient treasure map, Diane. Fell out of this flag that Simon found in an old chest. You see, that there, that shark lagoon, mm -hmm. and that cross there, that's the treasure. X marks the spot, you see. Where is this treasure island then, Joe? Um, let me see. Ah, yes, I know. Must be in the middle of the sea. Uh, Joe? Uh, 70% of the Earth's surface is made up of sea, so I don't think you're ever going to find it. Oh. Seventy percent, eh? Seventy percent. Oh, dear. Now, how many of you can do this? Here goes. Yeah! <laughs> one shot wonder. Now, I wonder if Trevor Holt can, because he's got a question about apples like this, and they're called Granny Smiths. Now, Trevor wants to know if there really was a Granny Smith, and the answer is yes. And here's a picture of her. Her name was Anne Maria Smith, and she lived in Australia, and she was better known locally as Granny. And she began growing this apple by accident from a seed she threw out in her orchard in 1868. And it became popular instantly locally, and it wasn't long before its popularity grew worldwide. Now, I have another question about apples, and this one's from Philip Parry. And he wants to know why an apple goes brown when you either bite into or cut it. Well, the inside of an apple is made up of billions of little particles called cells. The outside skin is too, but the inside cells are normally covered over by the apple's skin, so they have no contact with the oxygen in the air. Well, not directly anyway. So that when you bite into or cut an apple, two things happen. Now, firstly, when the oxygen in the air hits the inside of the apple, a reaction happens, and that's called oxidation. And secondly, by cutting the apple, all the inside cells that normally sit quite happily side by side get all jumbled up. So a combination of the oxidation and the mixing up of all these inside cells cause a number of reactions, one of which we can actually see, which is the colour changing on the inside of the apple. Mm -hmm. OK, chaps, what do you reckon on this? A good likeness, do you think? <laughs> this is an X-ray. You might have had one of these done. And uh, Joanne Bright has written in because she wants to know how they're made. So it's over to Buemi Chambera at the Westminster Children's Hospital, who's going to tell us. I visit Westminster Children's Hospital twice a week and sometimes I have to have an x-ray. Rubina, the radiographer, meets me. Hi, Buemi. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. Do you want to pop yourself on the table and I'll just set the machine up? Up at the back? Great. Yes. Okay, let's swing your legs up. That's it. Now I'm just going to pop this just underneath your leg like that. Just pop the pad under your knee. While I lie on the couch, Rabina puts a film plate under my leg. Then she uses a light to show the area that she will x ray. X-rays are very similar to radio waves uh, in that you can't see them and you can't feel them and you can't hear them. They're able to pass through your leg onto the picture. Nice and still like that, all right? The beaner goes into another room to operate the X-ray machine. You don't feel anything when you're having an X-ray. OK, now just keep very still. It only takes 90 seconds for the film to be developed, and then I can see the bones in my leg. Okay, Boemi, here's the picture that I've just taken, and you can see your bone here, and there's the pin that the doctor put in, and round here is just all your flesh and all your muscle. But the reason your bones look lighter on the picture is because the x-rays can't pass through your bone as easily as they can through your flesh and through your muscles. Who needs them, eh? Ah, when you've got the old seaweed sunny and all this fan mail and stuff. What more could you ask, really? Ah. Oh, yes, I've had this letter here about um, why lakes aren't salty. 
and do better to ask a salty question than salt miner himself. I haven't seen him for ages. Bung that in there. Here it goes. Over to salt miner. <laughs> What's up? What is Oh, oh, hang on, yes. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, there we are. All right, I'm coming, I'm coming. Hang on. Dear Corners, thanks for the explanation about why the sea is salty. But can anyone explain, please, why lakes aren't salty? My son and I have been puzzled for ages, and even our library can't help. Can you please? Anne O'Neill from Dublin. Well, first of all, did you catch my explanation about why the sea is salty? Did you? You see, the salt and the minerals originally come from rocks high up in the mountains, and they get worn down by the rain and the river and the wind, you see, and the salt and the minerals dissolve in the water and get brought down by the river, down into the sea, you see? So the salt is always pouring in, but then you get another process called evaporation and that happens when it gets very very hot you see the sun takes away the top layer of water turns it into water vapor and takes it up into the sky where it forms clouds you see but the salt doesn't go up no the salt gets left behind and that is why the sea is salty you see but lakes have got rivers running into them and they also have evaporation but why aren't they salty too well the difference is rivers you see, they have rivers running into them and rivers running out of them. You see, imagine this here is a salty lake and the blue inside was salt, you see. Now, even though the river brings salt into the lake like this, another river takes the salt out. You see, the water's getting lighter in colour as the water goes away. But where does the river take the salt out to? Down into... The sea! <laughs> Piece of fish cake. <laughs> now, your surnames keep pouring in, and the computer's been doing overtime. And Nicola Arkwright wants to know what her name is, so let's have a look on the computer. Now, Arkwright, an old word for someone who made cabinets or chests, and it was quite common in Lancashire, which is where Nicola comes from. And, um... David, Mark and Neil Dredge want to know what their surname means. Now, Dredge is an old English word for someone who made these. <laughs> Sweet. Oh, yeah, Arisha Patel wants to know what Patel means. Now, Patel was a name that was usually given to the headman of a village. Now, some names have more than one meaning, like Cornus, for example, means someone who lived on or in a corner, or the French word cornier could be someone who was a hornblower. <laughs> And there's nobody cornier than Joe. <laughs> Thanks for your surname questions. Keep sending them in, or you could go to your local library and get something like this, which is the dictionary of surnames, and you can look up yours or anybody's surname to your heart's content. I wonder what Kylie Minogue's surname means. Ah, regarde les sporty puzzles, s'il vous plaît. Here you are. There are eight sporty things, but only six squares for them to fit into. Two of them are going to be missing at the end, so keep remembering! Mm -hmm.